But if you don't have a chair, you don't have a chair. Um, I think if anybody, if there are any more empty seats, I see, are these taken here? There's one or two here. There's one seat right up here. And does anybody else have anything that's holding a coat or something that they can sacrifice? Okay, otherwise, welcome. This is the informal part of the evening right now. Um, welcome to our first Cambridge Forum program in our 31st season, which is very exciting. And I have a few announcements before our formal program starts. First of all, if you wish to receive information about our future programs, please be sure to add your name to the mailing list on the table. It's in the right in the back of the room, which you'll all rush to after this program is over and you've put your chairs away, because that's where all this stuff is. There's program, there's announcements about our future programs, and as I said, there is a mailing list that you can sign on uh, so that you can get material in the future about our programs. In addition, and I didn't get the chance to put it there, but again, after the program is over, for interested individuals, there will be tapes of this available. We are audio taping this. That's something which we do all the time. I'll allude to that in a moment. They, copies of those tapes are available for $11. It'll be a, a straight tape of this program, and you will be able to get those. If you're interested, you should uh, actually, rather than even sign in, you should simply send a check for $11, payable to Cambridge Forum, and send it to Cambridge Forum, 3 Church Street, Cambridge, Massachusetts, 02138. Put a note on there saying Chomsky tape, and I will send you a copy. That's actually the best way to do it. So anybody who wants a tape of this program, or if you have friends who you think may want a tape, they are available. They're $11, Cambridge Forum. If you take one of our program schedules, you'll have, this, you'll have the address, and you'll know what you need to do. As our friends are aware, this is important this evening, Cambridge Forum is a participatory activity, and the audience assists by folding the chairs at the end of the program <laughs> and stacking them in the front of the room or on back, actually even in a number of them, we're going to have to go back on the stands where we took them off. And you'll find out these chairs slide. It's a real drag, but it's a fun thing that we all do together. <laughs> we are also a voluntarily funded organization, and we welcome donations in support of our public programs which pay for things like the coffee and cookies that you'll also find in the back of the room. Some of you have found them already. I always do. Um, and finally, our programs are recorded for future radio broadcasts. I mentioned about the taping. The aisle microphone is for audio taping. You'll need to project, but please step up to the microphone. We all get really excited and want to shout out our question, but please step up to the microphone because that's the way we record your question, and that's the way that it will be that, that way it'll be preserved for the future radio broadcast if you're one of the lucky ones whose question gets included. So, welcome to Cambridge Forum. My name is Gail Leftwich and I am director of the forum. Cambridge Forum is now in its 31st year of providing live public forums for the discussion of vital policy issues with the goal of offering citizens useful information about the challenges facing contemporary society. The subject for discussion is the U.S. and the Middle East peace process. Our speaker, who is inaugurating a year-long Cambridge Forum series examining the challenging topic of the Middle East in this 50th anniversary year of the establishing of the State of Israel, is the ever provocative and illuminating Noam Chomsky. Dr. Chomsky is Institute Professor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where he teaches in the Department of Linguistics and Philosophy, an extraordinary intellect Professor Chomsky has written and lectured widely on linguistics, philosophy, contemporary history, and U.S. foreign affairs. The dilemma of relations between the Israelis and the Palestinians is a topic of long-standing interest for him, having recently published the 1996 edition of World Orders, Old and New, and spending part of this summer in Israel and the occupied territories to take part in events commemorating the 30th anniversary of the occupation. Welcome to Cambridge Forum, Noam Chomsky. There was uh, an interesting article in the Sunday New York Times by a respected commentator uh, discussing U.S. foreign policy, uh, and he explained that it had moved into what he called a noble phase, uh, and in one respect had even acquired a saintly glow. Uh, that uh, particular case was its administration of the Middle East peace process. Uh, well, you know, it's not unusual for the powerful to be lauded for their wondrous qualities, uh, but it rarely reaches the level of nobility and saintliness, although 
when you can think of a few uh, examples that it would be maybe impolite to mention. Uh, anyway, putting the uh, intriguing rhetoric to the side, uh, the picture is more or less conventional, uh, and, and it raises the question uh, just why a U.S. administration of the Middle East peace process uh, calls forth such uh, extraordinary accolades. Uh, it can't be just that the United States is advocating peace, because after all, everyone advocates peace, including Hitler and Attila the Hun and anyone you can think of, a peace on their terms, of course. Uh, so that can't be it. Uh, it can't be that the United States is implementing a peace process, though it is, uh, because that happens all the time, too, and we don't fall over in the claim for it. So, for example, 35 years ago, uh, the... Uh, apartheid regime in South Africa was instituting a peace process, establishing the first of the uh, homelands, the Bantustan, uh, and that was a genuine peace process, no doubt about it. Uh, the homelands were given, uh, they were given autonomy, uh, their blacks, blacks were going to be able to run their own affairs without interference, uh, they had opportunities, even opportunities for wealth and privilege, those who cooperated with the uh, uh, white racist authorities and running the homeland. Uh, the more enlightened elements of the uh, South African regime, the white regime, uh, recognized that it would be necessary to maintain a certain degree of uh, economic development, uh, just to keep the things going. Uh, so they proposed uh, and began to implement, in fact, policies of uh, putting up industrial parks around the edges, uh, which were places where um, white investors, but also the new black bourgeoisie who would arrive, uh, would be able to exploit the super cheap labor that was kept under control in the territories. Uh, another part of the program was that it was going to, as they put it, uh, indigenize uh, repression. That is, uh, make sure that the new massive black police forces and security forces in the territory uh, would be able to control the population directly with white force and reserve as needed. Uh, they could uh, control the population um, without concern for the high court and the human rights organizations. Uh, to quote Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin uh, when he was explaining the Oslo agreements to the uh, Israeli Knesset right after they were first uh, announced, uh, and therefore would be able to do a more efficient job without any bother. Uh, and uh, there are other properties which uh, ought to be familiar to those of you who pay attention to peace processes. Anyway, that was a genuine peace process, but it didn't uh, call forth uh, enormous praise. On the other hand, this one does, and then the, raises the question, why? What's the difference? What's the difference between the two? Uh, the question becomes, particularly appropriate when you look more closely uh, and you discover, as I think you do, in fact, that the South African uh, Bantustan project is an, a virtual blueprint for what the United States and its uh, dovish allies in the Labor Party uh, have, are implementing and carrying out uh, in, uh, in the current peace process. To stress, I'm talking about the Israeli doves. Shimon Peres, Yitzhak Rabin, the Labor Merits Coalition. Uh, it's common to attribute all of this to uh, Netanyahu and Likud and the sort of bad guys. Uh, but if you look, I think you find that their differences are mostly so, uh, style. Uh, in substance, it's rather different. I'll go on with this later. I'll just make a few comments now. Uh, well, uh, that's the question. Uh, in order to answer it, we have to be clear about what the peace process is. So let's have a look at that. Uh, I only have a few minutes, so I'm only going to mention a few things, and that means that every one of you who's on your toes uh, ought to feel that I'm omitting uh, absolutely crucial uh, factors, uh, and you're right, I am, and maybe we can fill them out later. Uh, but the general outline seemed to be more or less like this. Uh, if you want to discover what the peace process is, there's two major sources of information. Uh, one is the, uh, the official record, so the documents and so on. Uh, the other is what's going on on the ground. Uh, actually, they more or less coincide, so they're not in 
conflict, but they're two, those are the two sources of information, so let's look at them. Uh, the official record uh, begins in uh, six years ago in Madrid in 1991 when the Madrid conference uh, opened, the opening, the current phase of what's called the peace process. Uh, that was unilaterally run by the United States. Uh, they brought in the Russians as a kind of a fig leaf, but everyone knew that that didn't mean anything. Uh, it was a unilateral uh, initiative by the United States to impose a certain kind of settlement that the United States wanted imposed. Uh, the fact that it was unilateral was important. Uh, it could be unilateral because the Gulf War had just taken place. Uh, the Gulf War established power relations very clearly. Uh, Europe, it was clear to everyone that this was U.S. turf. Nobody was going to allow it to interfere. Uh, Europe backed off. The uh, Soviet Union wasn't around. The uh, Third World was in total disarray. The United States was then able to do something it had long wanted to do, but had been unable to do, and that is impose a unilateral settlement. Uh, now, the fact that it was unilateral was very important because the United States had uh, uh, the United States had opposed all international conferences and initiatives for years. And the, reason, the main reason was, it was to, that the U.S. had been in almost total international isolation on Middle East diplomacy for about 20 years. And since this is a crucial area of U.S. domination and it has the power to keep anything from happening that it doesn't want to happen, it was able to block every diplomatic initiative. Uh, the 20-year process of blocking every diplomatic initiative is called the peace process here but that's uh, another topic. Uh, in any event, that the fact that that happened is not in doubt. You can look at the UN record and the rest of the diplomatic record. Uh, after the Gulf War, the US was able to disregard the world and just institute the peace process in its own terms. And that's what happened at Madrid. That was the Bush administration, and it had terms. Uh, the terms are not so easy to know because they were never published here, but they're on the official, I mean, they're published in official documents, but uh, never made, made public. Uh, but they're there, and they're on the record. Uh, the Bush administration had an official policy. It was the Baker Plan, five-point Baker Plan. Uh, the Baker, Baker was Secretary of State. Uh, the Baker Plan, uh, its main component, uh, was to establish a framework for negotiations, that here are the topics that are subject to negotiations. And those topics, it said, were the coalition plan of the Shamir Peres government. The Israeli government at that time had a coalition of the right wing and the left wing, so-called the coup and labor. And it had come out with an official plan. Uh, and the Baker plan said, OK, that's it. Any negotiations have to be about the terms of the how to implement the Peres Shamir coalition plan. So there was a plan. It was the Baker, Paris, Shamir plan covering that spectrum. Uh, the turning to the Shamir, Paris plan, uh, its first principle, two basic principles. The first principle was, I'll quote it, that there can be no additional Palestinian state between Israel and Jordan. Uh, the crucial word there is additional. Uh, the meaning is there already is a Palestinian state, namely Jordan. So the issue of Palestinian rights is gone. There is no furthermore, further issue of Palestinian rights because that's been settled. There is a Palestinian state, it's Jordan, and there can't be a second Palestinian state. Uh, so what happens to the occupied territories? Well, that's the second point. Uh, the second point is that uh, the status of the uh, Judea, Samaria, and Gaza, the occupied territories, will be settled in accord with the basic guidelines of the government of Israel. That's the second point. Uh, the, and that's the US plan. That's the official US plan. Uh, as I say, it's kind of hard to find out because it was never reported in the press, but it is the official US plan. You can discover it easily. I'll give you sources if you like. Uh, the, uh, uh, that's the plan that was instituted in uh, Madrid. Uh, well, what uh, were the basic guidelines of the Israeli government? Now here you've got to look at a little bit of history. Uh, it, there are two major groupings, labor and Likud. Uh, the labor position was established back in 1968 called the Alone Plan. It's been modified a little bit over the years, but it's basically not changed all that much. Uh, the Likud program has taken various forms too. The most recent form was the Sharon Plan. Sharon's the kind of ultra-right uh, uh, Israeli uh, general minister and so on. 
uh, the Sharon Plan of 1992 and uh, re represents their approach. It's virtually identical with the Alon Plan. Uh, the differences are very small. Uh, what they both call for is uh, Israeli control of the resources of the occupied territories and the usable land of the occupied territories, but not the population. They don't want to have responsibility for the population. Uh, they should either be, either they should leave, which would be the best thing, uh, or they should uh, be under Jordanian administration or local administration or whatever, but not Israel's responsibility. Those are the basic guidelines of uh, uh, the Israeli government and of the U.S. government, and they are implemented because American taxpayers pay for them, and they don't know about it because they're not reported, but that's what they are. Uh, well, that's the uh, first stage of the peace process. The second stage is uh, two years later, in September 1993, when the Declaration of Principles was announced uh, with great fanfare in Washington. Uh, Oslo won. Uh, the Declaration of Principles didn't say very much, but it did say something. Uh, it stated that the permanent settlement, the long-term ultimate settlement, uh, will, be in, will uh, be in terms of United Nations Resolution 242 and nothing else. Now, that's rather crucial. Uh, UN 242, uh, which was agreed on in uh, November 1967, uh, UN 242 talks about peace among states. It says nothing about the Palestinians. Palestinians are mentioned only as refugees. They've got a refugee problem. But it calls for an agreement among states. Okay? Uh, and that's the, uh, that's the permanent settlement. It's agreement among existing states, a peace treaty among existing states. Now, those of you who follow the issue know that there's something quite significant about that. Uh, from the mid-1970s, the international consensus on this matter changed to include the concept of Palestinian national rights as well. And there's a whole string of UN resolutions uh, calling for Palestinian right self-determination uh, and uh, added to UN 242. And when you put those together, it becomes some kind of two-state settlement. Uh, the United States has voted against every such resolution usually alone or alone with Israel. So the votes every year are like 150 to 2 or something like that, rarely reported. Uh, the, uh, and if it reached the Security Council, the U.S. just vetoed it. Uh, but, so those aren't, are not Security Council resolutions. Uh, but uh, the permanent settlement, according to the Declaration of Principles, is to include UN 242, but not the other resolutions. So no Palestinian rights. Uh, notice that that's perfectly in accord with the official program of the Bush administration, and in fact, way back. Uh, the uh, second point to notice about UN 242 uh, is that it calls for peace in return for w Israeli withdrawal from the territories. Now, the question is, what is meant by Israeli withdrawal from the territories? Well, here again, you have to look at a little history. Uh, UN 242, when it was initi initiated, really, by the United States, uh, it meant total withdrawal. There is no doubt about this. The official U.S. position was total withdrawal in return for total peace, full peace in return for full withdrawal. There was a footnote which said you could have minor and mutual modifications. So like if the border is, you know, funny shaped at some point, you might straighten out the border. Uh, but apart from a minor and mutual uh, modifications, mutual notice, uh, there would uh, have to be total withdrawal. And that was official U.S. policy up until February 1971. In February 1971, the major turning point in Middle East diplomacy took place, the absolutely major one. You can tell how important it is by the fact that it has been totally wiped out of history. There's no reference to it. Even scholarly works refuse to talk about it and so on, but it's there. Uh, in February 1971, uh, Egypt, the President Sadat of Egypt, accepted official U.S. policy. Actually, he accepted it in an extraordinarily forthcoming way. He accepted it only with regard to Egypt. He didn't say anything about the West Bank or the Palestinians. He said, okay, he would agree to a full peace treaty with, Egypt, with Israel in return for uh, Israeli withdrawal to the uh, uh, international border, the pre-June, the border before the uh, June War in 67. Uh, that posed a dilemma for the United States. Would it keep its official policy, 
and then bring Egypt into the fold and stand alone and stand against Israel, totally isolating Israel in the world because it refused to accept this? Or would it shift policy uh, and join Israel in rejecting UN 242? Well, there was an internal conflict over it, and uh, Kissinger won out. Uh, his policy of what he called stalemate won. Uh, stalemate meant no negotiations, just force. Uh, that's, uh, and the US shifted its policy. Since that time, the United States does not call for withdrawal, uh, only for partial withdrawal, as determined by the United States and Israel unilaterally. Uh, so when the Declaration of Principles uh, states that the permanent settlement is to be in accord with UN 242, that means two things. It means no Palestinian rights and partial withdrawal as determined by the United States and Israel. Uh, that's the first, that's the next stage of the peace process. Uh, the next stage is uh, Oslo II, September 1995. Uh, as distinct from the Declaration of Principles, this is an extremely detailed document. Uh, hundreds of pages of details, and very much worth reading. Uh, it's, uh, again, never been reported here, um, except its existence. Uh, but it's worth reading, and you can find, I've written about it if you like, and there's sources about it. Uh, the, uh, that, that document says a lot of things. <clears throat> it spells out in great detail uh, how the United States and Israel intend to impose their Bantustan settlement, which is what it is. Uh, and it does spell it out. So it talks in detail about how Israel will take the water resources and how it will do this and that and the other thing. Uh, uh, you, uh, the Arab states and the PLO are constantly criticizing Israel for violating the Oslo agreements, and they are wrong. There is nothing that Israel can do virtually that would violate those agreements. <laughs> uh, the agreements are written, I mean, you know, you take some law student at Harvard and give him an assignment and tell him, write an agreement so that Israel can do anything it feels like. Uh, and uh, that's approximately what, that's pro pretty much what happened, I suspect. Uh, and that's uh, <laughs> approximately the way the thing is. Uh, if you think anything is in violation of it, <clears throat> you'll find a phrase somewhere which says it's not really in violation of it. Uh, and it's basically carte blanche. Uh, the uh, general idea of it is that uh, <clears throat> Israel will take approximately a third of the Gaza Strip and its <clears throat> crucial resources. It has, it's a very arid area, but it has some water. And that water has to be used for a few thousand uh, Israeli settlers so they can have luxury hotels and artificial lakes and uh, uh, water intensive agriculture, which is valuable to Israel, and subsidized fish ponds and so on, while the rest of the population, which is very dense, doesn't have any water. <clears throat> That's Gaza. Uh, on the West Bank, the <clears throat> Sorry. The general idea is that uh, it'll be broken up into several cantons, what amount to baddest tents, uh, which will contain the densely populated areas, but will leave for Israel the usable land and uh, uh, the resources and so on. Uh, the immediate, the first stage, uh, gave the Palestinians about 2 or 3% of the West Bank, uh, the like downtown Nablus, uh, Israel got 70% uh, and the other 27, 28% is under Israeli control and it's broken up if you look at the map into about 100 or more little pieces that are sort of disconnected where there's uh, Palestinian administration. It's certain that Israel's not going to keep that much territory. It's useless territory and they don't want it. So the settlement that they're moving towards is probably very much like the original Alon plan. Uh, which called for Israel to keep about 40% of the territory and the resources and not have to deal with the population. Uh, a rather crucial part of uh, Oslo II is that it completely rescinds uh, UN 247. Uh, this is not usually recognized, but it's important. Uh, one part of UN, two, uh, 240, sorry, UN 242 that everyone agrees on, on every interpretation, is that there are no rights of conquest, okay, that no rights accrue to military conquest. Uh, and in particular, Israel has no legal rights to the territories it conquered. But that's rescinded in Oslo II, which states that the Palestinians must accept, and do accept, since they signed it, uh, all right, legal rights of Israelis 
and Israeli-owned corporations uh, anywhere in the occupied territory. Uh, I'll give you the exact wording if you like. Uh, that includes what are called government and absentee lands, which amount to, you know, Israel determines it unilaterally, but probably half the territories or so, plus everywhere else, uh, even downtown Nablus. So that flatly and totally rescinds every last element of UN 242. Uh, the Palestinians are granted one right in the agreement, and have to, in fairness, have to mention this. Uh, Israel, uh, the Palestinians are completely responsible for and have total control over all legal claims against Israel for anything that might have happened during the occupation uh, from now to the future. So if anybody charges them with anything, the Palestinians are responsible for it. Uh, and if the charge goes through the courts, the Palestinians have to re um, pay, uh, pay Israel for any costs that it might have to pay for this. That's the one right that the Palestinians have, so they do get something. Uh, well, that's the official record. Uh, if you look at the facts, they pretty well correspond to it. I won't go through the details, but immediately after the Declaration of Principles, the Labor government, I'm talking about the Labor Doves, uh, immediately expanded settlement in the occupied territories. Now, they could do it for a simple reason, because folks like us are paying for it. Uh, otherwise, they can't do it authorizing it and paying for it. So with U.S. approval and aid, they immediately expanded settlement in the occupied territories to institute the intended version of the peace process. Uh, and uh, uh, the form is taking shape roughly in the manner that I described. Uh, if you look at the, um, <coughs> the issues of contention, like right now the, big, the negotiations are supposed to have been blown up by uh, Netanyahu's uh, construction in southeast Jerusalem and what Israelis call Har Choma, a little unsettled area of southeast Jerusalem, right in between a couple of Palestinian neighborhoods. Uh, that blew up the peace negotiations and has led to the current turmoil. Uh, that's blamed on Netanyahu, but that's only because it's convenient to blame it on Netanyahu. In fact, that building program was announced by uh, Shimon Peres's uh, uh, building minister in February 1996 uh, to begin approximately when it did begin, uh, exactly as it did, 6,500 units for Jews only in exactly that spot. And furthermore, they began to implement it. So even before the election, Palestinian demonstrators were trying to block bulldozers beginning the construction in Har Choma. Uh, Netanyahu, in fact, continued the operation and did it in the style that uh, the United States doesn't like and that Western humanists don't like, namely brazenly and in your face. Uh, when it was announced by the uh, labor government, uh, the labor minister announced, he said, we build quietly. Right. And that's the point. Uh, that's what uh, the United States likes. That's what the West likes. That's what Western liberals like. They don't want to have to have it presented to them in their face that this is what they're doing. Uh, the Labor uh, Party, because of the reasons having to do with its constituency, it's basically, it's not a party of working people, it's despite the name, it's a party of uh, professionals and uh, educated people and managers and secular people. Uh, and they understand the norms of Western hypocrisy. Uh, so they know that you're supposed to build quietly, you know, not uh, brazenly. And if you can find, it's very hard to find any other difference between labor and Likud. They're mostly differences of style like this. And the United States does find labor offensive, and American liberals don't like it, and so on and so forth. And they prefer labor. But it comes out the same way. Uh, the, uh, uh, that's true of Har Choman. It's true of a much more important development that's going on right now. Uh, is the Labor Party had a program called E1, uh, which is construction to the east of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, incidentally, is, does nothing much to do with what used to be called Jerusalem. Uh, Jerusalem is a big area, a big, ever-expanding area, uh, which is intended to reach virtually to the Jordan River. Uh, the intention of the Labor Party, explicit, I mean, wasn't a secret. Uh, if, you don't want, if you don't know it, it's because you choose not to know it. I mean, they didn't try to keep it secret. Uh, was to incorporate within Greater Jerusalem uh, a big urban settlements that they have set up uh, to the east, the biggest one is Ma'ala Dumim, uh, which goes to within a couple of miles of Jericho, 
and since uh, Israel's going to keep the West, the uh, Jordan Valley, that effectively splits the West Bank into two dissociated cantons. And the big and important building program that's going on right now, this E1 program, is between Ma'ala Adumim and, Jer and Greater Jerusalem. It's going to close off the little gap that remains uh, so that it'll then be a continuous urban area extending with the Jordan Valley, essentially cutting the country in half. And there are a couple of others. Uh, well, that's what's going on on the ground. It's com it's, you can't argue that it's inconsistent with the agreements. It's consistent with the agreements. Uh, it's the peace process, and it, in fact, uh, implements a kind of Bantustan settlement. It's not so obvious that it's more, it's better for the inhabitants than the South African Bantustans were. Uh, in fact, it may be worse for the inhabitants, but in any event, it, you could argue that, but it's uh, more or less the same style. Uh, there's another issue which Israeli commentators, and I don't mean Israeli doves, uh, refer to regularly as the central issue uh, in the Israel-Palestine conflict, namely the refugees. Uh, what happens to them? Millions of them around Lebanon and Syria and so on, Jordan. Uh, well, what happens to them was determined officially by the Clinton administration in an important move. Uh, the, there, there, there has been a, uh, there is a UN resolution uh, reached unanimously in December 11th, 1948, and voted, re reiterated unanimously, with unanimous support every year since, uh, which says that the Palestinians have the right of return or compensation. Uh, that resolution spells out the meaning of Article 13 of the uh, UN Declaration of Human Rights, which says that everyone has the right to leave their country or return to their country. Uh, that's the most famous article of the UN Declaration of Human Rights. Everyone in the United States knows it. Uh, because every December 10th on Human Rights Day, there was a big parade led by leading civil libertarians, etc., denouncing the Russians uh, for uh, their refusal to uh, live up to Article 13, which says everyone has a right to leave their own country. Uh, so why don't they let the Jews come to the United States? Big fuss every year. Except that's not what Article 13 says. It says to leave their own country or to return to their own country. And those last words were never mentioned. You can check. The reason is because the people leading the, de the uh, demonstrations were the strongest opponents of Article 13. They opposed having, allowing people to return to their own country. The meaning of it was spelled out the next day in Resolution 194, which said the Palestinians have the right of return or compensation. Now, of course, the votes for that were always hypocritical. Nobody was ever intending to live up to it. Uh, but fortunately, the hypocrisy is over. Uh, the Soviet Union is no longer around, so Jews are allowed to leave their own country. Uh, and the Clinton administration officially rejected the other half for the first time. Uh, it rescinded uh, uh, Article uh, 13 of the uh, UN Declaration of Human Rights and uh, announced it voted in the UN against Resolution 194. Uh, so the hypocrisy is finished. Now we just oppose the Universal Declaration totally, both sides. Uh, the, uh, and that was important. That meant that the central issue is finished. Uh, the vote was the usual one. I think it was like 150 to 3 or something like that. But if the US votes against a resolution, it's vetoed. Uh, that's what power means. You know. uh, if uh, there are votes at the UN, as there are, like 151 to 1, and the one happens to be the United States, it's vetoed. Uh, that's simply the meaning of power. Uh, well, I won't go on. Uh, what all of this demonstrates, I think pretty dramatically, uh, is how the world works, namely by the rule of force. Uh, those who have force and violence at their command get what they want, uh, especially if they can control information and knowledge and understanding uh, so that uh, nobody can protest because nobody knows. Uh, and that requires some cooperation on the part of the people who uh, spend their time more profitably talking about the noble and uh, saintly glow of uh, foreign policy. But the whole thing fits together rather coherently when you think it through, I think.
You are joining us at Cambridge Forum, listening to Noam Chomsky discussing the U.S. and the Middle East peace process. I'd like to ask you to continue your analogy to uh, what had happened in South Africa by uh, looking at what is currently, at most recently happened in, so in South Africa, in which uh, force didn't win, or perhaps you have an analysis that, that suggested in some way force managed to change and won nevertheless. And uh, assuming the former, uh, that perhaps in this case the U.S. will did not work its way because the U.S. will was moving in a different direction, certainly supportive of the prior disposition. What happened? Um, how can that happen in this case? Uh, and what might we all learn from the outcome of the South African situation that would be helpful and instructive in terms of how we think about the Middle East? Uh, well, I should say that, as you mentioned, I was in Israel a couple months ago for the uh, events commemorating the 30th anniversary of the uh, occupation. And in fact, I had just come back from South Africa a couple of days earlier, so the comparison was kind of in my mind. Uh, and the first talk I gave uh, in Tel Aviv, downtown Tel Aviv, just, just after coming off the plane, in fact, uh, started, I, I just took a paragraph from a scholarly history of South Africa, standard scholarly history, uh, describing the establishment of the first Bantu stand. I just read the paragraph, you know, and everybody knew what I was talking about. I mean, you can't have your eyes open and not know what I'm talking about. But the point you made is correct. Uh, what uh, happened in South uh, Africa is pretty dramatic and very complex and very ominous, in my opinion. Uh, what's been achieved is remarkable. There's no doubt about it. Uh, ten years ago was the height of the repression. Well, I'll say late. Yeah, about ten years ago was the peak of the repression. I mean, the African Af National Congress was not only wiped out in South Africa, but also in the surrounding regions. The repression was very harsh. Uh, the uh, repression against uh, uh, white liberals and radicals as well, and blacks. And it really looked like the darkest days of all. A couple of years later, it had fallen apart. Uh, and the change that took place is very dramatic. Uh, the uh, kind of like what happened, I mean, it's a little bit like what happened in the Deep South here, uh, where the effect of the Civil Rights Revolution was far more, far stronger than in the North. The North didn't change very much. I mean, the racist patterns remained and everything else. But in the Deep South, like Southern Mississippi and so on, it changed a lot. Uh, and the same is true in South Africa. So you can walk around, say, you know, Cape Town or whatever, and there, are no, there aren't visible signs of uh, racist discrimination. Uh, you go to a restaurant and there's blacks and whites and so on and so forth. Uh, all of that is very dramatic. Uh, and you can ask how it took place and then there's the question of what it means. Uh, well, as to what it means, first of all, it's not so clear. Uh, for about maybe 90% of the population, nothing's changed. Uh, the people in the townships, you know, like right outside the central city, which you, who you don't see. You don't see those people uh, because they're behind walls or something like that. But when you go down the highway, you know, there's a barrier and you don't notice them. Uh, but if you go through, uh, which, is, you, which is tricky, uh, you, you can't do it at night, for example, because there's no lights, there's no electricity in these miles and miles of miserable townships. And uh, they're run by gangs, uh, drug gangs, uh, terrorist gangs. Some, nobody knows exactly who they are. Some of them are probably hangovers from the old white racist regime, others new ones. Uh, so the people are simply terrorized. Uh, and even the activists who work there are afraid to go in at, at night. Uh, but they're there, you know. And those people, they've gained nothing. In fact, they're probably worse off, uh, both materially and psychically. Uh, they're worse off materially because the new government that came in, which is a black-run government uh, with ANC leaders and, you know, old fighters in the top positions, it has instituted a very harsh uh, structural adjustment program uh, of a kind that the white racist regime didn't quite have the strength or will to institute, uh, you know, World Bank, IMF type program, and it's having the usual effects. Um, these programs are supposed to bring about economic growth, and in a certain technical sense, they may. I mean, look at macroeconomic statistics. They might not look too bad. Uh, but they uh, sharply increase inequality. They uh, uh, reduce health and welfare standards. They uh, harm a substantial part, usually a majority of the population, particularly the more vulnerable, like women and so on. And that's happening there. 
uh, now by the black government. Uh, furthermore, they're harmed, I think, I don't know how to measure this, but I suspect that they're harmed psychically by the fact that uh, they can see, you know, that their former comrades, you know, people they fought with and fought with courageously and struggled with and so on, uh, some of them are now riding around in Mercedes Benzes and going to the best restaurants and living it up with the white folk and so on and so forth. I don't know exactly how that feels, but I can kind of imagine uh, and was told, in fact, uh, if you can't imagine. Uh, but that's the situation now, and um, just where to lead is not so clear. I mean, it might lead to a real blow-up. Uh, but. Uh, uh, so, so it's a complicated situation. I mean, there has been a dramatic victory, you know, a victory for, you know, the human spirit or something that you could hardly have imagined, and that cannot be denied and it's very evident. On the other hand, it has its ominous side, uh, and, it's not, and it's not clear how that's going to be resolved. There's a lot of conflicts and problems. Uh, how did it come about, the great victory, and it was a great victory that was achieved? Well, it came about, uh, I mean, here there are some analogies to the Israel-Palestine thing, but they sort of start to get, you know, to change, um, to break down somewhat simply because of questions of scale, you know. So like in South Africa, it was 80% uh, of the population is black or what they call colored, you know, uh, Asian origin, uh, and uh, or more. But whereas in Israel, it's uh, in Israel proper, it's a little under 20%, which is not Jewish. So the fig figures are almost inverted uh, in the territories. It's different. Uh, the, uh, there is an apartheid issue inside Israel, as there was inside South Africa, and it's very severe. Uh, again, that's something that's not talked about here because you're not, it's not pleasant to talk about, but it's true. So you may have noticed a couple of days ago there's a big front page story in the newspapers about the, uh, uh, the Russians uh, proposing laws which are going to persecute Christians, right? That, and that was a big horror story. And it was, you know, you shouldn't have laws persecuting evangelical Christians. But you take a look at those laws and take a look at Israel's laws persecuting Christians, and they're far worse, you know, incredibly far worse. So, for example, Israel has laws which bar Christians uh, from about over 90% of the land of the country. That's a pretty strong barrier, you know. Uh, in fact, Israel has laws barring Jews, you know, uh, rabbis can't conduct ceremonies and can't have prayer books and so on and so forth. Uh, but the worst ones are the ones discriminating against non-Jews, non-Jewish citizens, I mean. The laws aren't, don't specifically say Christians aren't allowed to do so and so. Uh, what they say is that, for example, in the case of the land laws, uh, that over 90% of the land is uh, under the control of an organization uh, which, by its contract with the State of Israel, uh, is uh, directed to work only for the interests of people of Jewish race, religion, and origin. And in a complicated set of ways, that's worked into the basic law, which is effectively the Constitution. Uh, well, that's a law. You know, That organization, incidentally, you can give tax-free donations to in the United States. Uh, it's the only country in the world where American citizens can give tax-free donations to a sheer racist law, you know, a regime that's quite extreme. And you can do it because nobody knows about it. You know? And again, it's not a big secret. That law that I quoted is from 1953. There's been plenty of time to find out about it. Uh, the, uh, uh, there's a law in the state of Israel called an anti-racist law of all things, uh, which says that no political party uh, can run uh, if it rejects the principle that Israel is the sovereign state of the Jewish people in Israel and the diaspora, not the state of its citizens. You can't run if you object to that. It's called an anti-racist law. It's kind of curious, uh, because it also had a provision in it to bar uh, the American uh, neo-Nazi Rabbi Kahana from running. He was they wanted him out of the political system, in fact, out of the country because of his advocacy of the Nuremberg Laws, Hitler's Nuremberg Laws, and other such activities. And the thing was framed to bar him, but as a kind of a sop to the other side, they added the provision I just quoted. Uh, and if we proceed, there's very strong persecution of Christians and, in fact, just non-Jews. In fact, also, you know, most American Jews don't fit their 
condition of orthodoxy. So there is, there is a serious, and we could go on, but there's a serious apartheid problem inside Israel. And in fact, it's leading to a very serious set of conflicts. Uh, there's something almost like a civil war brewing over issues of this kind, partly over the power of the extreme religious group, but it's a serious conflict because most of these laws were instituted by the secular labor you know, socialist element. And in fact, if you want to look at some of the ironies, uh, this land law that I mentioned is now being challenged by the far right. Uh, so uh, Ariel Sharon, who I mentioned, and the Netanyahu government, they want to privatize land okay, in line with their right-wing ideology. Privatizing land will mean breaking down this whole system of laws established by the secular left socialist element which have as one of their consequences barring non-Jews from land. You know. So the situation has many complicated convolutions when you look into it, but there's, there is a serious apartheid type problem inside Israel. It's not the same one that they had inside South Africa, but you know, has its similarities. Uh, as to the, uh, to the extent that the territories are analogous to the Bantu stands, yeah, which is more or less, it's in progress, it's not in existence. So like they haven't yet set up the Bantu stands. It's kind of like South Africa around 1960. You know? uh, but to the extent that that analogy is correct, uh, it was overcome in South Africa. This, I mean, in South Africa, it was never even an issue. So like the African National Congress, you'll read their literature, they never even talked about the Bantu stands. They regarded them so ridiculous, they didn't want to discuss them. Uh, the, so the, the analog to what Israel's doing in the occupied territories was virtually not an issue. I mean, like a sentence about it and saying, yeah, nonsense. Uh, because the struggle against apartheid was going on in the whole country without any differentiation between the Bantu stands and the rest of the country. Well, that's not the same in Israel there. It's going on to the extent that it's going on at all, uh, in at least in any militant fashion, only in the territories, that is, the future Bantu stands. Other things are happening in the country, but not that. Uh, so the analogies are not precise, but they're sort of there, if you think about them, and you can learn from them. Anyway, going back to your first and crucial question, how was it overcome in South Africa? Well, in a complicated fashion. Uh, for one thing, the pa world power never strongly supported the apartheid regime. So the United States, if the United States had supported the apartheid regime in the around 1960, the same way it supports Israel, that would have been a genuine peace process too. And here, you know, American liberals would have been talking about it as the peace process, and we'd been talking about how saintly it is, and so on and so forth. But international business and the South African business and the United States were not really happy with it. They didn't think this is going to be a useful settlement that will enable them to extract the resources of South Africa and get rich and do the important things. So the United States was kind of ambivalent about it. Didn't support it, didn't oppose it. You know, if it had worked, the U.S. wouldn't have objected, but it wasn't going to support it. Uh, and the same was true of uh, international, you know, the state system and the crucially transnational business generally. They never liked it. So, for example, IBM and those big companies really didn't mind the Sullivan Laws. I mean, they, as far as they were concerned, they could pull out and wait for a couple of black managers in there and then they go back in because uh, they don't care. You know, I mean, capitalism is basically not racist. It's just as happy to exploit anybody. Uh, you can, uh, if it be women or blacks or robots or Chinese or whatever, uh, as long as you can exploit them, really doesn't matter. They're all just interchangeable atoms. Uh, so there was no inherent reason to maintain racism, uh, and it was a bother. You know, it was interfering with business, it was uh, blowing the place up, and so on. So there, was, there were no ex powerful external pressures to maintain the apartheid system. Now, the U.S. did support it. But it supported it as ways of, say, you know, maintaining Mobutu in power and uh, killing Lumumba and murdering a lot of people in Angola and that sort of business. They used South African mercenaries for that. Uh, so that, in that sense, the U.S. supported it, but it wasn't really supporting apartheid. It was just support. It was just supporting part of its kind of international terror network, which needed South Africa. Uh, the uh, uh, so that's one factor. In, in contrast, the United States is strongly supporting, in fact, is implementing uh, the more or less comparable thing in, uh, in the Israel-Palestine region. Another crucial difference is that there was plenty of opposition to apartheid inside the white society. 
uh, very powerful opposition and very courageous and honorable people. So, you know, the blacks who fought apartheid, they really suffered. I mean, you know, years and years of prison and torture and exile and getting murdered and so on and so forth. But whites suffered too. I mean, plenty of them did oppose it and opposed it strongly and on principle too. It wasn't just out of, you know, because they wanted to make more money. So there was a principled opposition within the white society, uh, the ruling society, to the whole apartheid system, not just to the Bantu stands. Again, even like the white, you know, sort of human rights people, whatever you call them, uh, they weren't talking about the Bantu stands either. They also considered them too ludicrous to discuss. Uh, but uh, they wanted to dismantle the whole apartheid system within the society, and that made a big difference. Uh, there's nothing really comparable to that in the Israel-Palestine case, and uh, I should say a large part of the fault lies on the PLO in this case. Uh, I also, in Israel and Palestine, gave a talk at Beer Zayt, the uh, Palestinian University, and I talked about that, I mean, my, on the assumption that uh, wherever you talk, you should say the thing that people least want to hear, otherwise there's not much point about it. So talking at Beer Zayt, I mostly talked about the Palestinians and what they have failed to do, which is very significant. Uh, it's the only third world movement I've ever had anything to do with in my life, you know, there have been a lot of them, that never saw the point of uh, establishing links inside the oppressor society, either inside Israel or for that matter inside the United States. So they did nothing to support a solidarity movement here, which would have been extremely easy in my opinion. Uh, there have been efforts to try to change this for years and years and never got anywhere. Uh, and that's a major failure, and I think Palestinians have to think about it and learn from it. But, you know, our problems are, there are other things we have to think about and learn. Anyhow, that's one difference, because there was a, uh, you know, there was a strong movement inside South Africa of whites and, you know, so-called colored, I hate to use this, it's their term, and they still use it, so I'll use it. Uh, yeah, I know. Well, colored there means age. It's different. Oh, no, no, right. yeah. So like, you know, so it's like melee or something. Like that. Yeah. yeah, I mean, everybody hates it, but they use it. So the, this whole mixture of things, there, there was a, you know, there's a lot of solidarity internal to them, and they were really fighting together. And that made a big difference. Uh, that's uh, nothing, you know, that we don't know about from our own history. Uh, so there are, you know, there are differences, but there are also lessons, plenty of them. Uh, and I think you should, one should pay attention to them. The floor is now open for your questions and comments. And right, if you could work with the microphone. Acknowledging uh, your point that uh, all significant power is being exercised by the United States and Israel, do you see? Uh, interests that are self-interest for the United States or for Israel, either politically or socially or economically, that would suggest that it's in the long, in the long-term benefit of either of those countries to change its behavior in any significant way. And if so, we characterize. Yeah, I, I think that's a very crucial question, but I think it ought to be rephrased. Uh, whenever you talk about the interest of a country, you're already off track. Uh, countries don't have interest. You know? So are there... Yeah, people. Uh, well, corporate interest. Uh, well, as a matter... See, actually, that's complex, too. So, for example, uh, is, uh, thanks. Uh, the... the forces behind the denationalization of land in Israel are coming from the right-wing business community. Uh, they don't want the internal racist system because it keeps the land nationalized. You know? And they want it privatized, which means they want rich people to have it. Okay? And they don't really care that much if some of the rich people happen to be Palestinians or Christians or something like that. It's not going to happen much anyway because of the power system. Just like it's not happening much in South Africa, I should say, because the power system mostly remains, you know, little changes. Uh, as far as American corporate interests are concerned, it's quite compl it's in very intriguing. It's an unusual case in American foreign policy. I mean, if we drop all this nonsense about nobility and saintliness and try to figure out what's happening, uh, usually it's the case 
that major corporate sectors dominate the parts of foreign policy that are related to their interests. Like they may not care about other things that aren't related to their interests. Uh, the government, on the other hand, usually typically reflects a kind of a more general interest of the whole corporate system as a whole. That's why the Secretary of State usually comes from some uh, law firm, you know, Sullivan and Cromwell or something, or, you know, Dulles and Atchison and those guys. Uh, those are guys who represent the general interests of the corporate sector, not some parochial interest like, you know, an oil company or something like that. Uh, but uh, it, but where the a sector of the you know power system private power system has an interest in some region, they usually determine what happens there. So like the oil companies have had enormous have had enormous effect over um, you know, State Department and so on. Uh, now in this case, it's interesting. The oil companies have not won out. So when that conflict took place that I mentioned in 1971, that crucial one, as to whether to maintain to keep whether the United States should stay within the international consensus and continue to call for Israeli withdrawal, or whether it should shift to support Israeli expansion and withdraw from the international consensus, the oil companies were on the side of uh, the international consensus. They thought the United States should keep its policy, and they called for Israeli withdrawal. Uh, and in fact, um, their representative in this conflict was William Rogers, Secretary of State, who come as a background in oil interests. Uh, Kissinger was coming from another sector, a real sector of American power, but a different one. Uh, the military system, the military industries, uh, the whole strategic analysis system that was trying to uh, maintain Israel as part of, uh, you know, part of the system of control of the um, oil region by force. Uh, th this was, remember, the time at which what was called the Nixon Doctrine was being formulated. Uh, the idea of the Nixon Doctrine was that the United States no longer was no, no longer in a position after the Vietnam War and so on to intervene massively everywhere in the world. So we had to delegate responsibility. Uh, we had to have what the Defense Department called local cops on the beat, who would run the local region under, you know, police headquarters stays in Washington, but they do the local job. Uh, now in the Middle East, there's a big job to be done. In fact, the intervention forces and so on have mostly been directed against the Middle East, always, because that's a crucial interest. Uh, the interest is ensuring that the profits from oil flow to the United States and England, primarily the United States, uh, and not to the people of the region. That's a difficult thing to maintain, like, you know, like people in the slums of Cairo can't seem to get it through their heads that the wealth of uh, the oil producers should come to, to New York, you know, <laughs> not to the slums of Cairo. Uh, and the same with people in Saudi Arabia and, you know, all over the place. Uh, so it's been necessary to keep beating them over the head, you know, because they have these funny ideas. Uh, and in order to beat them over the head, uh, you need regional enforcers. And the U.S. has a network of them, uh, typically non-Arab. Uh, so Turkey, uh, Israel, uh, Iran when it was under the Shah, Pakistan, you know, that's kind of like a network of regional gendarmes who maintain what's called stability, meaning the wealth comes here and nobody bothers our local managers. That's the name for that is stability. Uh, and Israel played a role in that system, powerful role. Uh, it won that, it spurs really in 1967 uh, when it smashed Nasser. Well, there was a kind of like a war going on between Nasser and Saudi Arabia and Yemen. Uh, and Nasser represented what they call radical Arab nationalism, meaning independent nationalism, which said we want to run our own lives and resources and so on. And the Saudi Arabian government is just, a, you know, it's not a government. It's a family dictatorship, which uh, is what the British used to call an Arab facade uh, that manages the place under British rule. Uh, and they, got, they were being threatened uh, by the radical nationalist currents spearheaded by Nasser, even inside Saudi Arabia. And Israel put an end to that by wiping out Nasser and eliminating you know, the major Arab states and so on. And they won a lot of points for that. Uh, it happened again in 1970, uh, at the time of Black September, when Israel intervened to prevent the potential Syrian support for Palestinians who were being killed off by the Jordanians. 
the US British ally. Uh, and uh, the, the issue really at the time was, well, do we go along with the local interests of the oil companies, who are perfectly happy to see a Palestinian state or, you know, Israeli withdrawal, they don't really care. They just want to do their business and make their money. Uh, or do we go along with a big strategic conception of how to maintain the kind of control which, in fact, they think will ultimately be in the interest of the oil corporations, too? And that's a debatable point, you know. I mean, if you forget all moral considerations, you forget that human beings matter, and you enter into the world of actual political choices as made, then it's debatable. You know, it's not obvious which way to go, and you can understand why there's a conflict. Uh, since that time, the conflict remains. So if you read, say, you know, mobile corporation ads uh, in the New York Times and so on, they're rather dovish, you know, on this issue. So they don't. If the U.S. had been willing to go along, for example, in 1976, the Security Council debated a resolution calling for a two-state settlement, in, incorporating UN 242, but saying Palestinian state. It was supported by the entire world. You know, it was supported by uh, Europe, by the non-aligned countries, by the Arab states, by the PLO. You know, everybody. Uh, Israel opposed it. The United States vetoed it. But the oil companies would have gone along with it quite happily, in fact. Uh, however, they lost out in that conflict. Uh, and so it remains. I mean, it's an intricate issue in American politics. My own feeling is that if the population has had almost no role in this, it's just not been a political issue. Uh, so, uh, and part of the reason the population has no role is they haven't got a clue as to what's going on. You know? I mean, virtually nobody uh, has any idea how much aid the United States is giving to Israel. And even fewer people know that the aid to the oil monarchs is even greater. So the aid, the U.S., the U.S. taxpayers, what U.S. taxpayers have paid to the Arab facade, the oil monarchies that run, you know, make sure that the profits come here, at least, you know, as long as anybody was counting, it dwarfed what went to Israel. But nobody knows that either, you know. Uh, it was done through various tax shenanigans. Uh, the, uh, and the things that I've been talking about, about the diplomacy, are virtually unknown. I mean, even the official U.S. policy, say, of the Baker administration is unknown. You, know, you only know it if you read some you know, marginal literature or you look up actual original documents. Uh, since all the stuff is kind of out of the public arena, the public plays no role. Uh, and if it did, I suspect uh, there could be a shift in American policy. Uh, as in the case of South Africa. Uh, the anti-apartheid movement made a big difference. Uh, there, isn't a, there couldn't have been an anti-apartheid movement if nobody knew there was any apartheid. Yeah. Uh, so so it's, a, it, it's a complex issue. I don't think there's a simple answer. I, I think the, uh, here the intellectual establishment, the people we live among, you know, have a lot of responsibility for what happened. They're the ones who are keeping it quiet. Number two, uh, Israel plans on building a dam on a river by the Golan Heights. The previous administration was going to put it several miles below the Golan Heights. This administration, under Ariel Sharon, is planning on putting it a few miles north. And the last, which I think is the most important thing to mention, is do you think that the split in the Israeli Orthodox, ultra Orthodox, uh, religion about converts is going to affect uh, the support of the people uh, that are not ultra orthodox in this country and have any effect. Uh, well, on the on Israel and Lebanon, uh, there is a UN resolution uh, from March 1978, uh, which actually the U.S. voted for. Uh, calling on Israel to leave Lebanon immediately and unconditionally. Okay, that was March 1978. Well, they haven't left immediately or unconditionally, and the reason is the U.S. tells them, forget it. You, know, you can stay there and we'll keep paying you to stay there. Uh, that, uh, and that'll change when the U.S. decides it's time for them to leave. You know? uh, now, it's possible that they may decide on their own because it's becoming very costly. There's no, there's no strategic point in staying there. You know, they're not, 
by now it's kind of uh, kind of a policy that's feeding on itself. You know. uh, there's no threat that anybody knows of to northern Israel. In fact, the threat is mostly coming from their being there. Uh, so, for example, up until 1992, from from these from these before the uh, the Israeli invasion of Lebanon came after there had been nothing. Uh, a year of what's called in the scholarly literature quiet on the Lebanese border, meaning nothing coming south but plenty of things going north. Like Israel was bombing like mad all over the place and killing all sorts of people, but there was no nothing going from north to south, so that's called quiet on the Lebanese border. Uh, and uh, then Israel invaded and then it became not quiet. Uh, but even then, after the invasion, until I think it was March or so, 1992, not a single rocket went, or anything else, not a pistol was shot across the border. Uh, what happened at that time was that the Rabin government assassinated uh, a Lebanese cleric uh, uh, and his family uh, you know, in a car, and after that, attacks started coming. And if you look at the record closely, You'll find that there are rockets, you know, uh, Katusha rockets and so on, going from north to south to the northern settlements, but almost invariably uh, in response to some Israeli action against civilians somewhere in Lebanon. They go on all the time. I mean, mostly they're not even reported or they get a few lines and so on. Uh, and by now the thing is feeding on itself. I mean, Israel has a mercenary army in the south which runs the southern region by sheer terror. Uh, and they just don't want to leave them, and they've, you know, complicated things. Uh, but they don't really have all that much, uh, you know, the, the interests that lie behind it are not overwhelming. And in fact, it's costing Israel a lot of uh, soldiers now. They're getting, uh, you know, they're not able to handle the uh, resistance, uh, which is killing a lot of Israeli soldiers. Uh, and they may just pull out for that reason. In fact, the, one of the people who's calling for a pullout is the same um, Ariel Sharon. Uh, Sharon, the ultra-right general who sort of led the invasion of Lebanon, is now saying, look, it's ridiculous, let's get out. Uh, so they might leave on their own, or if the United States decides that they're going to leave, they'll leave. You know, if the U.S. decides it's over, they'll leave tomorrow. You know, uh, They're very dependent on the United States. They have chosen a position of dependency. They didn't have to choose it, but they did. Uh, and by now, the position of dependency is such that they cannot refuse American orders. And whether those orders come depend on internal things here, like population cares enough to do something about it. Uh, the second issue about the dam is a very tricky one. And I, and I don't know exactly how it'll work out, but and I wouldn't dare to predict. But these are things that have been going on since the early 50s about how to control the water resources of the region. Uh, the Eisenhower administration had a proposal, and Israel tried to block it. And the Eisenhower administration actually barred aid to Israel for a while to make them stop doing what they were doing, and then it sort of goes on. It's very complex. In fact, the conquest of the Golan Heights in the first place, a lot of it had to do with control of the headwaters of the Jordan and that sort of thing. Uh, right now, they're kind of, you know, I, I don't know. It's hard to know how much of this is symbolism and how much they really mean, but the, I think the answer to your question is, again, the same one. Uh, the way it ends up depends on what the United States is going to decide. Uh, if the U.S. decides, look, we want it this way, it'll very likely, you know, it's not like it's not like the laws of mechanics or something, but very likely it will come out that way. And I don't know. I mean, the Clinton administration is so is is the most extreme, hawkish pro-Israeli administration ever. In fact, they they were they're astonished by it in Israel all the time. I mean, you get you know, headlines in the papers about Clinton, the last Zionist, or. Uh, you know, never in history has there been an administration which was to the right of the Israeli government or something like that. <laughs> uh, so, so it's very hard to know how they're going to deal with it. But uh, anyhow, I think, you know, that's, I, I couldn't, wouldn't dare to, I mean, I think that's something you can do something about, not predict. On the other point, my, it's an interesting question. I mean, there's a lot of protest here from the Jewish organizations about the uh, proposal, which has not yet gone through, uh, to the latest version is to restrict uh, conversion to Orthodox rabbis, which excludes virtually most of the American Jewish community. And the community here doesn't like it, and they've been protesting about it, and so on and so forth. Uh, my strong suspicion is the Israeli government will block it somehow, you know, uh, because it's just too, uh, 
disruptive and dangerous to them. They rely very heavily, very heavily on external support. I mean, you know, it's, it's a very artificial, it's a rich country. Uh, so it's one of the rich countries of the world, but in a way a very artificial one. Uh, a lot of the capital formation and so on comes from the outside, uh, and that means here mostly. And they can't really threaten that. So I, I guess they'll smooth it over somehow. Uh, but it's not so simple because these are these groups are very strong and they uh, don't have uh, what we might call rational considerations. I mean, if you have a direct pipeline to God, you don't have to worry about what happens in the world, you know, uh, because you do what God tells you to do. And if he tells you to do something that's going to cause you, all of you to get murdered, okay, you do it anyway. Uh, so their calculations may not be within the sphere of uh, you know, what others might consider rationality. Uh, we're familiar with that too. We don't have to, I mean, the United States is one of the most extreme fundamentalist countries in the world, probably more so than Iran. Uh, and the, uh, that str we don't have to look very far to see that strain in policy. So we don't have to look to other places. We're familiar with it. Two questions. Uh, in regard to the conversation we had before the meeting, uh, can you give us a couple of examples of the most egregious, mainstream, uh, racist statements in terms of anti Arab sentiment and anti Islamic sentiment? And second, can you give us some details about the Joan Peters case and uh, Norm Tickleson? Well, I once uh, collected a bunch of egregious anti Arab <coughs> statements and stuck them in a book, and I think they're pretty wild, but nobody doesn't seem to bother anybody. But I, I would guess if a professor at Harvard, for example, uh, were to describe Jews as people who, uh, so I remember the exact words, people who bleed and breed and advertise their misery, you know, uh, people might think that that's not the right kind of thing for a Harvard professor to say about Jews, you know, saying let's not listen to these guys wail anymore, they're just people who bleed and breed and advertise their misery. But when a Harvard professor says that about Arabs, that's considered fine. Uh, if uh, uh, a leading uh, kind of uh, a hero of the left uh, said that uh, New York has New York City uh, is uninhabited uh, because it's got too many blacks and Spanish and not enough whites, it's depopulated. It's underpopulated. Suppose somebody said New York. That's the word. New York's underpopulated. There's a small number of white Christians, but you know, a lot of Jews and blacks and all those people. And we got to do something to overcome the underpopulation of New York. I think people would think there's something funny about that. But when you know, a hero of the left talks about the underpopulated Galilee, meaning too few Jews and too many Arabs, uh, nobody thinks anything about that. Uh, or when uh, the editor of a leading liberal journal uh, says, uh, Arabs lie, you know, uh, it's in their nature. So therefore, you don't have to believe what they say. It's part of their culture. Well, he said that about Jews. You know, you wouldn't last very long. Uh, if a well-known writer described, uh, a, a, talked about Jews and other third world detritus, you know, kind of rubbish, uh, you'd notice it, but not when it's Palestinians and other third world detritus, and on and on. Uh, furthermore, it's just, you know, it's like every report in the newspapers has got this. When Lebanon is bombed, every couple of days you'll notice a little item somewhere saying, you know, Israeli troops killed seven people in Lebanon. Uh, it's not considered an issue. You know. uh, on the other hand, if seven people got, Jews got killed in Israel, or seven Americans got killed in New York by a, ter by a foreign terrorist action, it would be considered something. Actually, I'll give you another example, which is, very, it's not strictly what you're talking about, but pretty close. Uh, the last uh, terrorist bombing in Jerusalem, uh, whatever, a couple of weeks ago, remember? Uh, the big terrorist bombing, real atrocity in Jerusalem. Uh, the same day, and it was the big front page story, you know, agonizing pictures of people suffering and so on. It was, yeah, that's the way you should treat a terrorist bombing. Uh, same day, uh, four bombs went off in Havana. Same day, okay. Uh, very similar, tourist places, just like the one in Israel. Four bombs went off in uh, Havana uh, in tourist places. Italian, fortunately not too many people were killed, but an Italian visitor was killed, his throat, his jugular vein was cut by flying uh, glass. 
Uh, it made the New York Times under world news briefs, you know, a couple of lines under world news briefs. Uh, well, then if you follow the story along, the two stories along, it's pretty dramatic. Uh, the proposal with regard to Israel, the supported by the United States, actually I brought it. So let me read the actual word so I don't make it up. I think I brought it. Yeah, here was what it was. Uh, when Albright was there, uh, the proposal supported by the United States is that uh, all Palestinian militant groups, what they call them, you know, uh, should have, would have to be outlawed and there have to be administrative, legal, and police action against military, political, civilian, religious, economic infrastructure, welfare societies, mosques, educational institutions, health centers, banks, investment companies, and et cetera, which support terror, okay? So in other words, Israel is supposed to in institute a real terrorist regime against anybody who might be regarded as in some fashion or other supporting terror, and the U.S. supports that. Nobody sees anything wrong about it. I take that same phrase and put Miami in instead of Israel. Uh, okay, any, uh, gr any, any humanitarian group or welfare group or bank or anyone else who supports terror in Cuba has to be outlawed without trial, administer no, no sentencing, you know, just toss them in jail, break up the group. Uh, how far would that go? Well, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, there, the bombings in Havana are whether they were carried out by, we don't know, but they were certainly supported publicly by groups who continually call for terror and are right sitting there in uh, Miami, you know, all around Florida, in fact. Uh, they're not only tolerated, they're loved, like, you know, Clinton goes and hugs them and kisses them and asks for their money and so on and so forth. And furthermore, they've been carrying on this terror since 1959. Like, it's not just the bombing the day, uh, you know, of the day, the same, happen, happen to be the same day as the Jerusalem bombing. Uh, so you can sort of compare the outcomes. Uh, but uh, in this case, it's been going on since 1959 from U.S. territory with U.S. government support and, in fact, with U.S. direct U.S. government participation. So if involvement, you know, if, if our own, say, degree of involvement in an act of terror was even a factor in making something newsworthy, the stories would have been reversed. It's the Miami, it's the Havana bombings, which would have been on the front page, and the Jerusalem bombings would have been under world news briefs. Uh, but it was the other way around. Partly it's racism, uh, but partly it's just that when we do it, it's not terror. You know, it's when we do it, it's fine. Uh, when they do it, it's terror. That's the definition of terror. You know. uh, this is an extremely dramatic case. Uh, and there are many cases like that. Let me just give you one last one, which is again dramatic because of the coincidence you might, everybody knows about the Oklahoma City bombing. Okay. Uh, so here's this horrible bombing, you know, truck bomb goes off, kills lots of people. Uh, if you recall, when the bombing took place, the first thought was it probably had a Middle Eastern connection. Remember? Uh, so there was all sorts of talk about how, um, I mean, some people say we ought to just bomb the Middle East right away, like Rosenthal and the Times, just bomb, bomb the bastard. Uh, others said, uh, well, if we find any Middle East connection, we're going to bomb, you know, bomb them. And uh, Clinton got up and said, we'll pursue them to the end of the earth, and so on and so forth. Uh, there were big headlines about how Oklahoma City looks like Beirut. Remember that? Uh, big bombs going off and blowing people up. Just horrible. Come, here's Beirut coming to middle America. And great horror about that. Okay, it turned out there wasn't a Middle East connection. There were people like Rosenthal who said, let's bomb them anyway, but uh, <laughs> others said maybe not. Uh, well, um, the, the, the rather, it's exactly 10 years before the Oklahoma City bombing, we kind of like anniversaries, so exactly 10 years before, almost to the day, a bombing did take place in Beirut. It's one of the reasons why Oklahoma City looked like Beirut. A, a virtually identical bombing. A bomb went, a car bomb went off uh, right outside a, a mosque, uh, timed in order to kill the maximum number of people, so timed when they were leaving the mosque, killed mostly mm -hmm. women and children, lots and lots of women and children killed, you know, babies torn to shreds in their beds, I mean, the whole story. Uh, uh, in fact, the Oklahoma City bombing was a virtual duplicate. Uh, now, if we're going to trace the attackers to the end of the earth, uh, we can easily get those guys. That is assuming that the U.S. Air Force has the capacity to bomb Texas and California and uh, maybe a bomb or two left over for London, because that bombing was carried out by the CIA 
uh, with the assistance of British intelligence, uh, aiming at a uh, Muslim cleric, Sheikh Fadlallah, who they missed, but they killed plenty of other people instead. Uh, so there's a perfect parallel. Now, just out of curiosity, I brought, personally brought that to the attention of a fair number of journalists. They, didn't, they couldn't even see the point. You know? They couldn't even understand what I was talking about. You know? uh, they could not understand why that's even a parallel. I mean, in one case, it's a bomb, maybe Middle Eastern in origin, that's what they thought, going off in Oklahoma City, so we're going to really you know, bomb them all over the place. And the other case was a bomb that we, we put in front of a mosque to kill as many people as we could in Beirut, so that's not an act of terror. You know? And that conception is so deeply ingrained in the psyche uh, that people can't see the point. Uh, uh, and you can go on and on with this. I don't know if you call this racism or not. I mean, it, somehow it's beyond racism, you know, but it incorporates racism as a special case. They were just Lebanese. So what the heck? Well, I mean, just like just say, you, had a, you also had a follow-up question. I'm sorry, you had something which I the forgot. The question about the Joan Peters case. Oh, the Joan Peters. Well, that was an interesting example. In fact, uh, like, like, let's go ba back to the Bantu stands again. Uh, when you go back to the Bantu stand case, I'm sure there were South Africa. I, I don't know the details of South Africa that well, but I'm willing to bet that when the homelands were established, uh, there were people within the white racist community who attacked the government for granting too much to the blacks. I mean, after all, the blacks are just recent immigrants, and uh, they could go back a couple miles across the border to where they came from, be just as happy over there, where they have to be on our side of the border for. Uh, so why not just get rid of them? And anyway, why give them all this land, and so on and so forth? I'd be willing to bet that there was something like that. Well, that's John Peters. Uh, John Peters came out with a book. John Peters is not of any interest, I should say. I'm not even convinced that she wrote the book. She may have been set up. A book came out with the name Joan Peters on it. Okay, Joan Peters, kind of nice lady, nice American blonde lady who sort of sympathetic and likes pal likes refugees and Palestinians and so on. Uh, she signed at least this book, uh, which said that the Palestinian that there's no moral. She made a grand discovery. I mean, everybody thought there was some problem about the you know, moral problem about the Palestinians having been kicked out, but there isn't any moral problem. She discovered the reason is they're all recent immigrants. Uh, they came in after the Jews, you know, made the land bloom and so on and so forth. And they'll be just as happy if they go a few miles across the border and, uh, you know, back to where they came from and live with their own kind. You know. uh, I, I am virtually certain that if somebody knew the South African literature better than I do, they could find the counterpart. You know. Well, the fact that the book came out, that she, that she or probably was a committee job, whoever wrote the book uh, did it, that's of no interest. What is of interest is the reaction. The book was a huge sensation. I mean, it had hundreds of laudatory reviews uh, in the, by scholars and intele leading intellectuals and so on and so forth, saying, wonderful, we finally realize there's no moral problem. Palestinians never have blown, you know, are just recent immigrants. They can go back and live you know, across the border. It's all over. We, we won. You know, okay, we take it, period. Uh, literally hundreds of laudatory reviews, barely a false note. Uh, and it's hard to find anybody who wasn't swept up in this, uh, you know, huge wave of applause. Uh, there was one person who wasn't, I mean, there were a few people who knew there was something screwy going on, but there was one guy who was a graduate student at Princeton, Norman Finkelstein, uh, who uh, was studying the history of this subject in the Middle East Department, and it just looked fishy. You know, uh, the book had full, a lot of footnotes, you know, documents and so on, uh, and he start, started checking them. They were all faked. It was all fabricated, which is why I think she didn't write it, even if she existed. She disappeared, incidentally, after this thing was finally exposed. Probably it was some kind of intelligence fabrication. I don't know. Anyway, uh, he started unraveling it, and he wrote a preliminary paper, short paper, which he sent around to about 30 people concerned with the Middle East, scholars and others. One of them was me. Uh, he got one asking, look, does this look like something I ought to continue? He got one response from me. Uh, I didn't know at the time. And I told him uh, very straight, I said, look, I think it's an interesting topic, but if you continue with it, you're going to destroy your life. You better face it, uh, because you're going to expose the whole intellectual community as a bunch of frauds and hypocrites and Stalinists, and they're not going to like that. You know? And they are very vicious people, so they're going to make sure that you're dead. You know? 
uh, and I told him virtually in those words, and I said, maybe if you want to do it, do it with eyes open. Okay. He decided to do it. Uh, the, his own work started getting circulated, so people knew about it, but they would not allow it to be printed. Uh, he was thrown out of his department at Princeton. Uh, the professors wouldn't talk to him, you know, big Middle East scholars and so on. I won't go through the whole story, but it's pretty ugly. He uh, does extremely good work. He just had two very good books come out on the Middle East. But he lives in a little apartment in New York and a couple thousand dollars a year with an occasional job as an adjunct, uh, you know, teaching you know, students who don't know how to read at City College or something like that. Uh, well, you know, that's the way these things work. Uh, his work, uh, the book was never exposed in the United States, but the publisher made a stupid error. Uh, they decided, since it was such a huge hit in the United States with eight printings and so on and so forth, they decided to let it appear in England. Okay. Well, as soon as I heard it was going to appear in England, I took Norman Finkelstein's material and I sent it to friends in England, uh, journalists and scholars and others interested in the Middle East. England doesn't have the same censorship on this issue. As soon as the book came out in England, it was blasted. You know? I mean, all the major journals just ridiculed it as a pile of nonsense. You know, a lot of them used Norman's material or added other things. This included very well-known Middle East scholars and you know, intellectuals, Times Literary Supplement and all this sort of thing. Uh, people here read the British reviews, like they read the Times Literary Supplement and the London Review and so on and so forth, and it was embarrassing. I mean, what the reviews were saying is that you know, virtually the entire American intellectual community uh, was deciding to accept a sort of Stalinist-style fraud because it's in the interests of their particular politics, even though the thing is so transparently fraudulent that it falls apart as soon as you look at it. That was embarrassing. And uh, the thing disappeared, you know. I mean, nobody said, gee, I'm sorry, I lied about it. Uh, but it kind of disappeared, and now you're not allowed to talk about it anymore. Okay. That's basically the story. Uh, there's a lot more to it, which is even uglier, but that's more or less it. I can make one more statement just for yeah. radio purposes, sorry. We are at Cambridge Forum discussing the U.S. and the Middle East peace process with Professor Noam Chomsky. Uh, Roger Reisner, Radio uh, Maine. Anniversary. This is the 30th anniversary of the bombing, shelling, whatever, of the USS Liberty waters off of Israel. Can you update us as to, you know, is this ever going to get out in public as to what happened? And also, on your information, what do you speculate the reasons for Israel attacking the USS Liberty? Um, you know this story. There was a, uh, an, uh, this is during the 1967 war, right? There was a US spy ship Liberty, unarmed, kind of electronic, you know, picking up electronic communications uh, in the Mediterranean. Uh, and it was uh, attacked by um, Israeli torpedo boats and planes. Uh, and uh, uh, remind me about the numbers, I think about 30 or 40, 38 American sailors were killed and like a couple hundred wounded. Uh, the ship was almost sunk, not quite. It was able to kind of limp back to Naples, where it came from. Uh, the, uh, uh, what happened is, um, I'll go back into what happened. I mean, it was, there's no doubt that it was attacked by Israel. I mean, that's not in question. Any, at first it was denied, but by now it's not denied any longer. Uh, the thing was kind of hushed up. There was a Naval Board of Inquiry hearing which shut it up, and uh, uh, the Liberty sailors are pretty angry about it. And they have an organization which still exists, uh, which is trying to get some publicity for this. Uh, they got plenty of uh, high-level people saying this was just a straight attack, you know, admirals and secretaries of state and so on and so forth. But the thing is just embarrassing. Nobody wants it out. Uh, so there's no compensation. I think maybe there was some kind of compensation, but virtually nothing. Anyway, it's a non-existent thing. Uh, why did Israel do it? Well, you know, we don't have the documents, but a fair, my, my own speculation is that it was done probably to prevent the United States from uh, getting the information that, the United, that Israel was planning to invade the Golan Heights. The United States was not in favor of that. Uh, the, Golan, the United States did support Israel in the war, but after the ceasefire, 
After the ceasefire, Israel invaded the Syrian Golan Heights. After the ceasefire. And Israel, the United States was not happy about that because it was extremely dangerous. Could have led to a nuclear war. Uh, that war was a very close thing. Uh, if you can believe Robert McNamara, who was the Secretary of Defense, uh, well, his words are, we damn near had war with the Russians. Uh, the documents have still not come out, so we're relying on secondary commentary. But it appears as if uh, there was a direct confrontation between the American and Russian fleets in the Mediterranean, and the American fleet sort of turned around a Russian military vessel and, you know, it could have been a war. Uh, the, uh, there was a hotline. We know there were hotline communications uh, right at the end in which Kosygin was saying, if you want war, you'll have war, and so on. Call off the Israelis or else, you know. And right at the end of this, uh, Israel invaded a Russian ally, Syria, uh, and conquered the Golan Heights. And there's a good chance, I think, this guessing, remember, that they did not want the United States to know that they were going to do it because it would have been stopped. You know, if the U.S. had known, they probably would have stopped it, not because they had any objection to it, but because it could have caused a war. That's my guess. You know. uh, but. Uh, there's a lot of strange things about this. So, for example, if you read Yitzhak Rabin's memoirs, he was chief of staff. He has his memoirs came out, and he writes all about this. In fact, he says the bombing of the Liberty was the worst moment in the Six Day War. You know, uh, that's when we were really, we thought we were really in bad trouble, and it was the worst moment there and big issue. He misdates it by a day. He puts it a day earlier than it happened. Uh, you know, that's not the kind of mistake that the chief of staff can make about the most serious event that took place during the war. Uh, according to his dating, it wouldn't have had anything to do with the Golan Heights. Well, I don't know. Suspicions. Uh, the, nothing has come out that's definitive, but that's my guess. When the ship was attacked, uh, it did manage to radio back to the Sixth Fleet in Naples. Uh, saying we're under attack by some foreign, they didn't exactly know at first who it was. They said we're under attack by torpedo boats and planes, you know, protect us. And apparently the Sixth Fleet did send off bombers. I think F-4 bombers, if I remember. But American military preparations were such that they only had nuclear-armed bombers. So they sent off nuclear-armed bombers from Naples to, to, attack, to bomb somebody, you know, like not knowing, no specific target like maybe Egypt or maybe Russia or, you know, whoever it might be who was attacking this ship. And at that point, it could have well been under the control of the flight commanders, you know. Uh, they were apparently called back by the Pentagon just, you know, very last minute, which might have also averted a nuclear war. Uh, when it finally became clear that it was Israel, they just backed off. Uh, and uh, there's other stories if you want to really feel chills up and down your spine. Uh, the, the U.S. command in Washington knew that the Liberty was in danger. And they, a couple of days earlier, they sent communications to it to say, get out of this zone because it's a dangerous zone. Uh, the trouble is uh, all the fancy communications, military communications that you guys pay for uh, worked as follows. Uh, the message didn't go to the Liberty because of some error, it was sent to the Philippines, you know. And when they got it in the Philippines, they, you know, somehow, I don't know, they sent it somewhere else, I think North Africa or someplace. I mean, it took a couple of days for it to, I may have the details wrong, some story like this. It finally did get to the Liberty, but only after it was being bombed, you know. Uh, so that's uh, military communications. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's, uh, the, the, but the heart of the story is it's being silenced. It's being silenced because it's just too embarrassing. And the Liberty sailors don't like it, and plenty of other people don't like it, but uh, it hasn't reached the public domain, you know, much. I don't know of any new information about it, really. There's one success story in, in Arab-Israeli-Jewish relationships, and that's a small village of Neve Shalom. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Here in Jerusalem, Tel Aviv. And uh, for 25 years, Arabs and Jews have lived voluntarily side by side as neighbors. It's the only place in Israel where uh, they send their kids to the same schools to learn Hebrew and Arabic. Otherwise, they're separated. And they've trained 20,000 people in conflict resolution and negotiation. 
Now, I, well, I'd like your opinion. Why is this such a tough sell? I write I, I, I part time for the Globe. I came back from seeing this. I told the foreign news editor there's a terrific story, there's some good news, and some solutions, not just problems out of Israel. What he told me was, uh, look, he says, give me a good bombing or an assassination. I'll put it on page one or two. But peace between Arabs and Jews, that's not news. Now, why is it such a tough sell to get some positive news, to get some solutions? And there are some. This is a prototype. It could serve as a model for, you know, for successful living and coexistence. They've worked out a lot of, uh, a lot of ways to do it. Why is it such a tough sell? Well, here I partly agree with your editor. I don't think it's, I mean, I think it's a really interesting story, but I don't think it's news in the sense of uh, a way to solve the problem. Much more relevant to solving the problem would be for the United States to abandon its extreme rejectionist stance. Uh, if the United States were to join the rest of the world, I'm not talking about anything radical, just join the rest of the world uh, in accepting what is a long-standing international consensus, virtually unanimous, in favor of a settlement that recognizes both Jewish and Palestinian national rights uh, and involves Israeli withdrawal according to U.S. policy. If the U.S. were to move to that, that would probably settle the problem, too. That's a much bigger issue. Why can't that get in the globe? I mean, I'll tell you why, because I, you know, I've been trying to get it in for 30 years, uh, including I was a friend of the, I don't know what happened to this, but. I mean, I, I don't know if I want to say this in public. I'll tell you in private if I like. I'll tell you in private if I like because I've been through this with the editors back as far back as the late 60s. And they simply will not break ranks on this one. Nor, I mean, you know, in a way, I don't blame them. Like, if they were to publish this and it weren't to appear anywhere else, they'd look crazy. You know? I mean, if they were to publish the straight facts about the diplomatic record, I mean, I, I, you shouldn't believe what I told you tonight. Look it up, you know. Okay, it's all public documents. If I'm not telling the truth, you'll find it very fast. But if what I said is correct, and I think you'll find that it is, uh, it wouldn't be very hard to, you know, it, it, it's, it, it changes the story quite radically. Try to find it somewhere. But if the Globe were to break ranks on this and to publish things that you don't find in the scholarly literature and that the New York Times won't publish and uh, so on and so forth, uh, they couldn't get away with it even if they wanted to, which they don't, because you know, they're just as committed to the same policy. I mean, they're the same, you know, part of the same liberal establishment that says this is what we want, you know. Uh, as to this story, I mean, I think they might run it on the style page. You know, human interest story, it Jews and Arabs get together. Seven months and seven editors, and it ran in the education Yeah, okay. I, I picked the wrong one. But, you know, it, it'll run as a human interest story somewhere. Uh, but if it is going to interfere with the radically rejectionist policy of instituting a Bantustan-style settlement and calling it peace, it's not going to be on the front page any more than this other stuff is. It's a, it's a very tough sell, you're right. Yeah, it's a tough sell. I mean, you yeah. know, they, they want violence, they want problems. It's not that they want violence and problems, they want solutions that fit U.S. power interests. That's Not necessarily. Like, for example, they were perfectly happy to feature on the front page uh, uh, the signing of the Declaration of Principles on the White House lawn with a headline saying, Day of Awe, you know? Okay? Day of Awe, Palestinian surrender, you know? Uh, give up, and the United States wins uh, and rams through its rejectionist program. That wasn't violent. But it was a day of awe, you know, with everyone falling all over themselves and, uh, you know, adulation of uh, American nobility and so on. So it's not just violence, it's, it's servility to power. That's what they want. for the notion of anti-apartheid as a campaign when you were in Israel um, just recently. Did anybody seem to say, oh yeah, this is you know, something we can actually talk about? Yeah. And my third question, actually, is this whole notion of Netanyahu withdrawing funds from the PLO. I mean, isn't, what is the states doing about this? If the PLO is there to enforce you know, this whole security thing, 
then putting them in a position where they can't pay their you know, police. And there have been reports that a lot of the police are getting ready to have some sort of a, you know, insurrection. I mean, don't you think that's incredibly sure? They can't pay their police, but that's not the whole story. Remember, can't pay their police means can't pay the uh, forces that are carrying out indigenized uh, repression. Their police are very brutal, you know. They probably have the highest proportion of uh, police per capita, I guess, in the world. The police work very closely with Israeli intelligence, you know. Uh, and uh, they repress the population. They torture, they arrest, and so on and so forth. I mean, I'll tell you, you know, all about it. Uh, furthermore, when Israel isn't paying the funds, uh, that means Arafat's not squirreling away more funds in his private bank account than Bank Lumi, you know, to pay off his cronies and so on and so forth. I mean, it's tricky. Uh, furthermore, when they don't pay off the funds, the European Union pays, or the World Bank pays. Okay, they don't like it, you know. Like you read the London Financial Times, they're kind of unhappy about having to pay off, uh, uh, you know, the Palestinian administration, who are mostly gangsters, incidentally. Uh, to, uh, uh, because Israel's withholding funds, and the United States doesn't like it either. I mean, one of the things that all, when Albright was over there and she gave him a few taps on the wrist, uh, one of them was release the funds, because, you know, we don't like to pay it this way. Uh, so, yeah, it's counterproductive from the U.S. point of view, and they'll make them stop. In fact, they're starting to pay the funds again. Uh, but, uh, so, so, but I think that's kind of like a technical issue. I mean, cutting off the funds had nothing to do with terror or anything else. Just it's, it's like the closures, which also have nothing to do with terror, just punishment. I mean, the, the way the closures work, if you really want to look at it, I mean, you know this, but uh, so, for example, if, if there's an Arab terrorist act, Palestinian population is locked into the, to their villages and so on. Uh, what happens when there's a Jewish terrorist act? Same thing. You know? So after, <laughs> literally, uh, so after um, Baruch Goldstein, this American immigrant, uh, killed, uh, what was it, 29 people or so in a mosque, you know, sprayed them with a assault rifle or whatever he did, uh, the, popu the, Arab, the Israeli army, the Arab population of Hebron was placed under tight curfew and stayed that way, a very punitive curfew. The Israeli army went through and smashed up the Arab market, and destroyed it. You know, it still hasn't been rebuilt and never will be rebuilt because the new Hebron settlement doesn't allow it. And there was a whole bunch of punishments of the Palestinians for the fact that uh, an American Jew murdered 29 people in a mosque. Well, yeah, that's the way it works. Uh, the, and it works that way because uh, folks here pay for it and say, uh, 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 let it keep going. Uh, the, uh, but the, you know, this particular punitive act was uh, like a mild one as compared with others. Incidentally, when you compare labor and Likud, uh, you know, people say how terrible Netanyahu is and so on, which is true, it's pretty awful. Uh, but the fact is, with regard to the Palestinians, in some ways he's better than labor. So like he's relaxed the harsh labor closures. More Palestinians are allowed to go in and be slave laborers in Israel than they were under labor, okay? And you know, they don't like being slave laborers, but it's better than starve and seeing your children starve, okay? So uh, it's a mixed story, you know? Uh, the, uh, on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, I think it's a very important issue. There's gonna, you can predict, there's gonna be a huge hullabaloo next year. You know, it's already starting. Uh, leading up to uh, December 1948, which is going to be the 50th anniversary of the signing of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And you can, if some of you want to make some money from journals, you can write the articles right now, you know, and send them to the Atlantic Monthly and the Boston Globe and so on when the right time comes. And the articles will say, uh, we're standing up for the universality of the Universal Declaration and we have to defend that against the third world relativists who think that you shouldn't, you know, that there's special cultural relativism and so on and so forth and we can't stand that because it's universal and, you know, there can't be any et cetera, et cetera. You can write the articles right now. If you're not original enough to write them, you can go back to uh, uh, the huge flood of articles that appeared in 1993 when the Vienna Conference was taking place and the United States was standing up courageously to defend the universality against the third world relativists and so on and so forth. Uh, those are the articles you can write if you want to get a fee. If you want to get a kill fee, uh, not even a kill fee, like get kicked off the newspaper if you're on it, or not get your article published, you can write an article which is the truth. The truth is that the United States is, a, is a, a, one of the leaders 
in rejecting the universality of the Universal Declaration. It flatly rejects one whole component of it as having no status whatsoever, namely all the social and economic rights. I mean, they have the same status as the so-called anti-torture rights, but the United States doesn't like them. I mean, they call for things like people having, being free from hunger, you know, having enough, uh, having health care, having a job, having security. I mean, all that kind of stuff we don't believe in. It's there in the, I mean, we, you know, like the guys who make the noises. Uh, they uh, don't believe in that, and the U.S., official U.S. position is these things have no status. Uh, the way Jean Kirkpatrick put it rather crudely, uh, they're like a letter to Santa Claus, you know. But they're right there in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. They don't count because the U.S. rejects them, okay. Uh, if you go to the so-called, you know, the ones that we theoretically do support, like Article 13, it's sheer hypocrisy. I mean, there's nothing more hypocritical that I know of than what happened with Article 13. I mean, here, year after year after year, big demonstrations, editorials, fusses about supporting half of Article 13, the half that you can use as a weapon to beat the Russians over the head with, but not mentioning the other half of Article 13, which we're opposing, not mentioning it. Go back and do a database search. If here's a nice research project for anyone who wants not to get a degree uh, in, the, in a good political science department. Do a research job and see if you can find out when somebody mentioned those missing words or returned to their own, and returned to their own country, meaning Palestinians return or get compensation. Okay. Well, we didn't like that, so therefore it was cut out. Uh, the hypocrisy on this is mind-boggling. Take Article 14, the next one. Uh, it calls, it says that everyone has, uh, refugees have a right to uh, asylum, right? I mean, the day of the Vienna Conference opened with Warren Christopher over there talking about universality, blah, 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 and the editorial writers and, you know, the, everyone screaming about it. That day, the Clinton administration turned back another uh, boatload of Haitians fleeing from this murderous terror regime. Uh, Haiti is at that time being blockaded, of course, illegally uh, by the U.S. Navy, Coast Guard, actually, uh, which was sending back uh, victims of terror to further terror. I mean, you know, the whole thing is so outlandishly contrary to every element of international law, you don't even know where to start. I mean, like if Libya was, you know, had the United States under a blockade, so you couldn't leave the country, uh, people would think there's something wrong, you know. But when we uh, put a blockade around Haiti to keep people fleeing from torture and terror from doing so, as they're, as we are, uh, and, of course, not accepting them here, as we're required to do under Article 14. It's not even, I mean, barely mentioned. Actually, the Globe, the Globe reporter somewhere, uh, the Globe had a mention of it, a line in a story about something else. You know, forget the exact, what the story was about, but in, the, in a story about something else, they actually had a mention of this. I don't think the Times and the Post even covered it. You know. this, here's the day of the Vienna Conference, when everybody's screaming about the third world relativists who don't believe in the universality and so on. Well, it just goes on and on like this. I mean, I, th I think the U.S. is now one of the three countries in the world, last time I saw, uh, which hasn't ratified the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is, is just a word. You know, it becomes applicable when you have enabling legislation, legislation which says, okay, we'll do something about it. The United States has one of the worst records in the world on this. It doesn't pass enabling legislation on almost any issue. And when it does pass enabling legislation, it is always what's called non-self-executing, meaning cannot be applied in U.S. courts. Okay? So it means zero. You know, no support. In fact, our support for the Universal Declaration is approximately zero. Uh, uh, well, these are things that ought to be brought up as the uh, hysteria begins. In fact, before it begins, so you can maybe preempt it a little. Uh, what the chances are of getting the truth on this issue, I don't know, but it's worth working on. Uh, not just to expose what's going on, but because the Universal Declaration is important. I mean, those rights really matter, you know. I mean, it's, you, know it's, you could maybe make a better set, but they are, it's an impressive declaration. And it's kind of like a minimum of what decent people ought to be for. Uh, and if, if there are relativists who say we don't have to live up to them, well, that should be exposed. And if the relativists are sitting right here in Harvard Square in Washington, yeah, it's even more important to expose them, especially when they're leading the, the anti, 
the crusade against the Universal Declaration. So I think it's a good thing to do. And an important campaign, because it's going to be a major issue leading up to the 50th anniversary. You can be sure of that. I just wrote an article about it, uh, just running through a lot of the details, which are pretty amazing when you look at it. I'll appear in some anthology in <laughs> England in about 25 years or so. <laughs> I mean, you can have it if you want. Just, no, no. Well, they haven't asked for it yet. <laughs> if you're interested, I'll send you a copy. <laughs> really? Wow. <laughs> How'd that happen? Okay. <laughs> I think Professor Chomsky will stay perhaps and talk informally after this, mm -hmm. but I'd like to, if possible, wrap it up. So. Thank you, Professor Chomsky. <laughs> Professor Noam Chomsky. listening to a program of Cambridge Forum, a free public forum in Harvard Square, Cambridge, Massachusetts, co-sponsored by the First Parish in Cambridge Unitarian Universalist, the United Ministries of Harvard and Radcliffe, the MIT Chaplains, the Lowell Institute, and the Friends of Cambridge Forum. For an audio cassette of this forum on the U.S. and the Middle East peace process, featuring MIT Institute Professor Noam Chomsky, send the check or money order for $11 payable to Cambridge Forum, 2 Cambridge Forum, 3 Church Street, Cambridge, Massachusetts, 02138, or call 617-495-2727. Our Cambridge Forum next week will feature poet and critic Professor Helen Vendler discussing reviewing the contemporary. Thank you for joining us.